I bought a thousand Bitcoin when it was $3. I don't regret not getting in early. Yeah. I regret selling when it was $5.50 because I didn't understand it. That was a hefty profit, right? Hey everyone, it's Gordon Einstein again, conducting a series of interviews with thought leaders in the blockchain, crypto, and beyond space. Uh, this is all in connection, of course, with the AIBC slash Sigma Summit, which will be happening in Dubai, where we are right now, in May of 2021. It's an exciting time. And I'm thrilled to be here speaking with my good friend, Steve Mead. Uh, I've known Steve for several years now. He's been kind enough to have me on his show and has generally proven himself to be very wise when it comes to enterprise, logistics, capital raising. Very nice, mellow guy who explains things well and is very entrepreneurial, has been doing videos and education and business for decades now. And I've seen the Thank videos. You. Decades. Um, <laughs> so let me just kind of pass it over to see you. Steve, it's very, I'm very happy to see you. Jordan, they, yeah, see so, you as in, in person. In person. So this yeah. is not Clubhouse. This is not this Zoom. Is, this is not Clubhouse. It's not Zoom. It's not LA. We're sitting yeah. in Dubai face to face. So it's that, very cool. Which is like amazing. Yeah. And of course, this fly is joining us and becoming a third party. Um, so we're going to, this is going to be a short interview. That's going to sure. set the stage for your attending as a speaker at the AIBC yeah, Summit. Absolutely. Um, let's kind of break this down into three parts. The number one part is I always like to do the Wolverine style origin story. Okay. So I want to know the, the story of Steve. So not just what you're working on now, but how you, you know, what's your background? How did sure. you get into crypto? That sort of thing. But definitely want to hear about the projects you're involved in. My story is the same. I consistently say it over and over again. Lifelong entrepreneur, never had a job. Uh, technically because I'm unhirable, so I don't fit within the box or mold of a corporation. And I didn't learn that till many years later. I used to take a lot of assessment tests and I wasn't successful and I learned why I, my brain just thinks outside of the box. Uh, retail stores in college selling watches, infomercials when I was in my 20s, sales training for Travelers Group. But I started an internet company in 96 mm -hmm. doing transaction processing and it's what went, kind of went on to become PayPal. And I got out of that. That was March of 99. There's your buddy, by the way, the fly. Yeah. And when I left in 1999, I wanted to do something next and I couldn't figure out what I wanted to do. And I looked around and I thought about how can I fix business financial settlement instead of credit cards? And I was like, how can we put business financial settlement on the internet? And that was my first foray. I tried to build a global currency. Mm -hmm for business settlement and in the year. this is back in 99. 99, 2000. Yeah, like we built- Before phones and, before and, and cars. Phones, phones. Yeah. Uh, there was a book called Cryptonomicon by Neil, who's, who's a great yes. author in LA. And yeah, I just, I tried to create a global currency and I actually, I made the mistake of calling it a currency. And yeah. what I've learned, this is the educational side for the entrepreneurs. What I've learned when you're pitching or presenting a company is a couple of things. One, mind is like water, path of least resistance. Whenever you say something, people take your thought down something they understand. Mm -hmm. So if you say the wrong words, they end up going down a path you don't want them to. Mm -hmm. And the second thing is, if they're asking you the wrong questions, it's your fault for, for explaining it improperly. If they ask me the right questions and they don't like what I'm doing, I'm fine as long as they can understand it and tell me it's a sucky idea. Sure. But when they don't understand it and it's a sucky idea, I'm a little frustrated. So. The point of that is calling something a currency. And then again, if they're, them asking the wrong questions is probably fantastically valuable because it lets you know well, that's, you need to raise your game. That's the third wise, part. Right? Yeah. A lot of the times yeah. the companies I start, I say, why won't this work? You know, so I'm looking for negative feedback. I don't mind people telling me something's wrong with the idea because sure. it gives me a chance to fix it. The point, Gordon, was when you call something a currency, people ask you questions based on a currency. What's it backed by? Who's going to, you know, is it gold? Is it a reserve? Is they were illegal. asking, yeah, they yeah. were asking me a bunch of currency questions and what I was really creating was a store credit. So Brock and I, you know, who's big in, in Bitcoin and blockchain and all of that, Brock and I had met in, in the early 2000s and he was doing global gaming and creating sort of game currency yep. and I was trying to do global currency. And so Brock actually helped kind of, I won't say Brock educated me. I love Brock for what he's done, mm -hmm. but the education was lacking. So when I sat down with Brock, People ask me, oh, do you regret not getting in Bitcoin earlier? And I look at them, I say, I don't regret not getting in early. I got in in 2012. I bought a thousand Bitcoin when it was $3. 
I don't regret not getting in early. Yeah. I regret selling when it was $5.50 because I didn't understand it. That was a hefty profit, right? Yeah. Back that time, right? Yeah. $3 to almost six, double your money. Like I didn't understand Bitcoin as a technology. I thought it was a gift card. And, mm -hmm. you know, so my, my foray and entry into this has been longstanding, but I approach it more from a business tool than a, a trading tool. You seem to be a very good communicator. You know, I've seen your shows. You mm -hmm. you seem natural, or maybe practiced. I maybe. can't tell which, uh, or maybe both, in yeah. front of the camera or in front of mm -hmm. groups. Is that a? I'm always curious about this kind of stuff. Is that a skill you developed? Was that a native affinity? And like, what, what... I, first off, Gordon, thank you for the the compliment. Appreciate it. I was afraid of public speaking, as most people are. I didn't have to do it through college. I gave one oral, you know, public speech in high school and the professor said, sit down. Mm -hmm. No, I went to work when I was 22. I went to work at Travelers Group in a sales cult. And I have no problem saying that we were a full on sales cult, but it was a fascinating training program. I read 357 books in six and a half years. And, and, and you, you tell people That's that they're like, pace. it is yeah. and it's not. It's one book per week. But, and this was, again, I'm, I'm old. We didn't have Kindle and all this. So it's one book per week, six and a half years, 300. I'm totally diverted the conversation. I personally, and it could be an age thing, you kind of alluded to that. I, I personally learned better, better with physical books. Yeah, There's that's something what, about the tactile nature of it and kind of knowing where you are. The I can't tactile quite nature, it. that, the ability to take notes, to go back and remember. I can't do online books. I can't do Kindles because I'm like you. Yeah, I need the tactical side in the notes and my visual recall is stronger on pages than it is on on technology i have to be real straight i i've adapted to reading on my ipad just because of my mobile life and i, I yeah. wish I, I you know i had such a huge collection of books but i would always move them to place to place and eventually i got tired of boxing yeah, and unboxing it's it's rough and the, the stack never goes down it only yeah. expands and i always had the thought i would go back and read that book but i i just surrendered to I surrender to the flat screen, except when there's something that I just deeply need to learn. Yeah. And then I'll, I'll print it out. I'll literally print it out wow. and, and hold it and just mark the heck out of it. Because yeah. there's something about the ingestion the, process. The, I like the that. tactile side. What, what happened as a result of that training, we had a very specific program for teaching public speaking. And, and as I looked back, I knew what it was. It was a, a process of steps. So. If you won a contest at our company in the first 30 days, you became a two minute speaker. You had to stand in front of the group, 300 people on a Saturday and just say, why are you excited? But by the time you were there, you saw other people, some good, some bad. You were, if you hit certain other milestones, then you had a two minute topic. Before that two minute topic, we would start taping you. We would measure your crutch words, your ums, your huhs, your huhs, your so's. Crutch words. They're That's crutch words. Thing. Okay. I like yeah, that. It's a crutch word. Um, and it, it's, frustrating when you watch people on television or news. Um, okay. So, hum, uh, they're crutch words. They're designed to fill a pause as you don't know what you want to say, rather than letting that pause hang there, you'll drop an um in, um, uh, take them out crutch words. And we drilled, we taped, we taped on planned pauses. Now, I probably just held that pause for a li about a second, maybe a second and a quarter. Mm -hmm. It feels like an eternity. And we would tell people, hey, hold your pause for one second. And they would jump in and we would tape. We would tape, we would time. Then we would teach left, right brain symmetry. While you see me on stage, I don't stand in one spot. I make them give me a handheld mic. Mm -hmm. Even today, everybody else is behind the podium. Ah, it's good to move around. Left, right, it's left, right brain symmetry. It's not just good. When you walk to one side of the stage, the people follow you with their eyes and they access the logical part of their brain. When you go to the other, their eyes follow across and you access creative. So left, right brain, you yeah. move across, the eyes access different components. When you step right, forward- Again, I, again, I, you're, you're a fascinating guy, so I'm gonna divert the conversation. A technique I use is I get off the stage and walk into the audience because right. I'm, I'm trying to subvert expectations. And that's a technique called step forward for emphasis, step which is what I just was emphasis. starting to say is Amazing. you step okay. forward for emphasis. You step into your audience to completely change the dynamics and you pick the right point to do that. The whole audience perks up. Where are you going? 
Yeah, so those these are all you and, and you're so natural. This stuff. This is obviously taught to you as a technique, but you've internalized it so deeply. You're correct. You're completely once, natural. At once you point. practice it, then it becomes much more innate, and you find when your pauses are, when to hold, when to step forward. And I'll give you another one, tricky. I don't want us to run out of time. I love this one. Public speaking. I'm extending the time because thank you. Because like, I love you, buddy. You, <laughs> so you would know that yeah. public speaking when you're up there is very draining and tiring. And the reason for that is, is we want to give a lot of energy and we want to present. The real reason, Gordon, is people are in the audience are sitting there going, okay, give it to me. Give, and they're sucking all the energy out because it's your job to motivate them or inspire or educate. They're sucking this energy from you. Okay. And you've probably seen me do this. It's a, it's a neat little trick. You can use it. It's easy to learn. You ask a question. How many of you like going to the pool? And you raise your hand as you're asking the question. Mm -hmm. It's not a yes or no. It's a raise your hand. It forces people, everybody raises their hand. One, that picks up their physiology. They know they have to pay attention. But the wave of energy, when you have 3,000 people raise their hand, what they don't realize is the hand wave releases all of that energy to you. Nice. So through the course of a long presentation, you get people to raise their hand. It not only keeps them awake, mm -hmm. it recirculates energy back. Okay, I like it. So yes, very trained, very practiced, thousands of hours we drilled on this, taped, video, timing, everything. Fascinating. And then um, I, I know what project I have you associated with in my mind, but I don't know if it's your current one, so I won't put my foot in my mouth. Yeah. What's the name of your current project? Veneta, Veneta project. Still, okay. Same one. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Because you're a very entrepreneurial guy, and I know you work on sometimes I, more I than one thing this. at once. So I'm, I'm, I'm a I'm parallel being... entrepreneur, not a serial. My, yes. my joke is I build a car. Mm. I can only drive one car at a time, but I might build two or three hoping I can find somebody else to take over that project. Fair enough. Because it's, it's almost impossible to run effectively two or three things, but you can start them and have this sort of genesis there and mm. maybe find somebody who's not a good startup person but is operational and you can say, hey, I've got this project and you can sometimes find people. I, I joke, it's like building a race car. I just don't want to drive or, you know, you need a driver. You know, there's different skills and different times. And, different and uh, I'm, not a, I'm not a driver operator. I'm an innovator. I'm, I'm the guy on the stage getting people interested. I'm not the guy on the stage selling. It's a, I got it. But they, of course, the interest can lead to a sale. It but can. It, you know. um, so give me your impressions of Dubai. Dubai's fascinating. As, as, as you know, Gordon, I, I've spent a lot of time in Malta. We researched jurisdictions. I spent a ton of time looking at tax, language, government access, infrastructure, um, things in terms of the government's interest in new technology. And Malta was really fascinating and still is. Dubai, in my opinion, is going to supersede potentially any other jurisdiction in the country or in the world. That's bold. So not just supersede any European jurisdiction, but globally. I don't, I don't know a Europe. When you start looking at all the different components, there's not, there's not, Germany is the most, you know, economically viable country and they're amazing. They're, they're, they're great at engineering and diligence in terms of access to capital between Dubai, Abu Dhabi, and the whole GCC. You've got amazing access to capital. You've got a government who is now very proactively willing to work with entrepreneurs. They're interested in new Sorry, technology. are you speaking about the GCC generally? Or, I mean, Dubai. Um, du well, Dubai, Abu Dhabi, and even up through, I'm looking at the whole region. If you look at Dubai, very entrepreneurial, the Silicon Oasis, the Dubai trade zone, yes. access to, you know, not not full access. I still don't know the hierarchies. It's there's a lot of different princes and sheiks and his excellency. And I don't mean that pejoratively. There's just a lot of people I don't understand. No, it's a polyarchy. All the rules and rules yeah. yet. Yeah. But getting access to some of the power dynamics of people that are the decision makers is easier in this country than it is in most of the European ones. Getting Probably getting so. access to, you know, the 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 upper echelon in Zurich through Switzerland and the bank and like, like it's, it's a, it's a different layer that is much more difficult to get into. And even when you're there, they're not as accessible and interested in new technology and innovation and collaboration. And you may, it's interesting you say Switzerland. Um, 
I, I you're saying you mentioned Germany and Switzerland. I, I just from personal experience, I found Germany to be a little, just be real blunt, a little bit more st stiff about it. They are. They're, and, they're uh, very, but that's what makes them good at, at engineering and systems. They're not innovative. They're not, uh, you know, they're innovative in an engineering way, not a technology, finance, fintech, a lot of the other ag tech. There's so many other mm -hmm. things than what I think Germany's really good at. Again, not putting them down, but I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, just this is not politically. Yeah. We don't have to be politically, you know, correct here. Um, <laughs> sometimes we do. Well, sometimes we do. Yeah, where are we? <laughs> but uh, it's just it's interesting the dichotomy because you, you mentioned two countries that are very close to my heart, Germany mm -hmm. and Switzerland. I think I just Switzerland they seem, especially in Zug. Zug's fine. Look, look at the infrastructure of of Switzerland. Look at the hierarchy. Look at the nature of banking, which is resistant to change. Yes, yes. Okay, Look at the tax it. structure. Look yeah, the at taxes the, are rough. Thank you. That's what I'm saying. When you start looking at the totality of things, Dubai's got the some of the free trade zone. They've got the interest in bringing new companies here. There's 8,000 new companies that set up here. There's some really innovative things they're doing with taxes. It's an English speaking country. Yes. You know, it's 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 open to innovation and outsiders and Americans, especially because they it want really to. good food. And I'm, I'm not a foodie, but if you but you're working out. So food doesn't matter when you get open gyms and get the workout. Uh, good theory. Yeah. <laughs> OK, yeah. so let me just. Yeah. So, so Dubai, I'm fascinated by. I think the money side of Abu Dhabi eventually needs to catch up with Dubai for more of the funding. Abu Dhabi is a more institutional money organization, meaning it's almost like Chicago. Chicago's money structure is B and C and D, which are late stage companies. They'd rather do a $50 million deal than a 5 million, yeah. which is fine. It's just that legacy type of big money infrastructure mm. needs to move down to startup innovation and hubs. And it's starting to. Also, they're so physically close. It's not like you have this New York Chicago, San Francisco, geographic space. No, that doesn't matter as much as, as it I agree. used to. And they, again, the word collaboration, there's not this, New York doesn't want to collaborate with Chicago. No. Chicago has a chip on its shoulder to New York. San Francisco kind of wants to collaborate with LA just because they want to be in the beaches. They don't really want to. Mm -hmm. Abu Dhabi, Dubai, the UAE, the GCC. Then when you throw in the Abraham Accords with the Middle East, now you've got this participation that has never happened before yes. where I, I innovation to me out of this region is fascinating and then the, my last component to this is dubai uae gcc does a lot of work with india and africa so for as much as china is this massive burgeoning economy it's more difficult to do business with when you look at africa and india and throw in mm -hmm. middle east and the abraham accords that is a massive opportunity of new up and coming developed continents in Africa, India, which is established with a massive population mm. and the innovation of this area. That's a clever comment. You're right. And Dubai has geographic centrality and also very strong infrastructure. Links to the infrastructure rest of, as you're implying. ports. Yeah. So they have ports, so they have shipping. So the, the aspect of logistics, it's yeah, I think it out of anything outside of Europe, I think it will beat anything in Europe I could come up with. Interesting. And just to our final fantastic topic, sure. AIBC, AIBC Sigma. Sigma. You know, yeah. well, happy to have I, you, but you know, just... we'll have to see if Sigma gets pulled off. There's still some communication around gaming and gambling yeah, in this area, but I, I was being but, but but our hope is that Sigma will be here. AIBC for sure. Yeah, yes. I'm excited about that in May. And we're excited to have you. I'm, Thank I'm, you. I'm speaking as if I were an organizer, but <laughs> yeah, I get, yeah, you know, I've been deputized. <laughs> I've heard of these interview series, but yeah, it's, you always do a great job presenting. You're always doing interesting yeah, stuff. You. You're always like I said before, explaining things in a very accessible manner. And yeah. I, th I think they're lucky to have you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I tend to reverse engineer and overthink things because I, I like trying to figure things out. Mm. And the more, you, the more aspects you can look at, the better decisions you can make. They aren't always yes. going to be right. Timing could throw it off, economic, political. There, But if you at least have a rationale for your decisions, then if externalities happen, you don't feel bad. Makes right, right. Like I can't control politics. I can't control a ship going sideways in the Suez Canal. That would never happen, though. No, like the, and who would? The, who would have thought? Who, the ship, the size of the Empire State Building, goes sideways in a canal in the middle of nowhere, and backs up 480 ships. Like that would never happen. Must have been some good scotch, but yeah. 
That's the funniest joke I heard was the driver was hungry and pulled over looking for a falafel. Oh my God. Oh, well, yeah, they have good falafel around it. All That's right, Steve, thank you so much. I really appreciate the time. Appreciate it. And we'll see you again in May. Absolutely. All right. Fantastic. Thanks. Thanks.